Guys, what do you say we preview this UFC on FX8 card? Because we've already been talking about Vitor Belfort, so uh, what do you say we run it down? All right. What do you want to start, Stevie? Well, well I, I guess we can start with Belfort Rockwell because we're talking about Belfort so much. Uh, I, I, you know, I've been in the Luke Rockwell advocacy camp for a while now. I, I've been saying over and over again that it's ironic that people say he's not a star, yet all his fights did well, at least for Showtime Strike Force fights, they did good numbers on Showtime. I, I don't know if you can call them good numbers in the grand scheme of things, but they always seem to exceed expectations. And I think Luke Rockle has a little bit of a cult following out there. And I, I would even go so far as to say, even though he's like ranked number five right now, I think he might be a little bit underrated. And I, I'm just dying to go out there and see him prove all the doubters wrong and, and show once again that Luke Rockle is the real deal. And, uh, I think he's got a legit chance to do it against Belfort. It's he's a, he's an interesting fighter in that it, he's he's very much a question mark at this point. I mean, it, and it's sort of funny because Peter Belfort is is a guy that throughout his career has been one of those fighters that you really don't feel like you know what you're going to get on a fight to fight um, basis. You know, like like BJ Penn, you sort of don't know whether you're going to get. A and a, 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 traditionally throughout his career, you don't know whether you're going to get a very dangerous Vitor Belfort or whether you're going to get a sort of out of it Vitor Belfort who doesn't perform at, at his level at the level that he's potentially able to fight at, and that's sort of been true throughout his career. But here we reach a fight where the the question mark in this fight is really Luke Rockle. I mean, Vitor Belfort in the last few years has been pretty darn consistent. I mean, he doesn't always turn in a, a great performance. But he generally comes in solid. We haven't seen him mentally crumble in a fight in, in years and years and years. He's got heavy hands. He's a good striker. He's got pretty good takedown defense. He's got a pretty good ground game. He's pretty much a known commodity. And then on the other hand, we've got Luke Rockle, the guy who um, has, has done very well in strike force, but perhaps not at the same competition level that you would get in the UFC. Um, the, the strike force guys in general have done pretty well coming over, but I think that a lot of those guys have been tested against a higher level of competition than Luke Rockhold had. Um, Rockhold really is his best wins have been narrowly outstriking a wrestler in Tim Kennedy and a jiu-jitsu guy in Jacare Souza. Um, he hasn't really been in there with a lot of guys of the mold of a Vitor Balfour. In fact, hasn't really been in, that, in there with anyone of that mold. I mean, probably the closest thing is, as far as just sort of fighting a guy that's coming in there to strike is Keith Jardine. And Jardine is, is nowhere near the striker that Vitor Belfort is and was well, 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 well past his prime as a fighter. Um, so, I mean, Rocco going into this is a big question mark, whereas I, I don't feel like Belfort is as much of a question mark. And it's interesting, the odds makers have um, Luke Rocco as, as a narrow favorite, which I wouldn't have necessarily expected going in. So it's it's a big fight for Luke Rockle. He'll have he'll have the opportunity to suggest that um, either you know he was a guy that really um, you know deserved the credit that he was getting in some circles for his performances at the end of Strike Force, or he was a guy that was just essentially a big fish in a small pond, and uh, you know we'll, we'll get a good signal of of which he is on Saturday night. Yeah, and uh, before Peter chimes in, I just want to add to that that. I, I don't know that he was necessarily a big fish in a small pond because we've seen some of the other fish from that pond come over and do very well in the UFC. So it, it seems to me the competition level between Strike Force and UFC was a lot more of a level playing field than a lot of people saw or felt before the two brands merged together into one. And uh, with that, I want to go to Peter. Uh, I'm actually going to go with Luke Rockhold. Um, I'm actually might even. I don't know if it's an upset or not, but I'm going to say Rockhold by, uh, oh, freak. I want to say knockout in the third round. I don't know why. I just see him connecting with a punch and just rocking Belfort and, uh, before, you know, ref can jump in, a couple more shots landed and then the fight's over. So I, I just don't see, I don't see Vitor winning this fight. I think Rockhold is very underrated, as you guys said. And, uh, you know, I, Steve, where do you have him ranked on your rankings right now? Um, I believe my ranking is the same as the rest of the UFC.com ranking panel. I think it's number five. Yeah, I think I, I think a fight, a win here by Rockhold, a decisive victory, not a decision, but a decisive victory by Rockhold, will vault him into at least the top three and uh, possibly uh, a future title shot against Anderson Silva or Chris Weidman, whoever comes first. You know, uh, 
Rockhold, I think he should have the attitude of playing with house money, and that is the fact is he he really has nothing to lose here. He has everything to gain. If he loses, okay, he can come back in his next fight. But this is his one big shot right now to vault himself into a title contention in that division. Wow, um, guys, this is a totally random segue, but I just went to the rankings panel, and the pound-for-pound pound list is quote-unquote currently unavailable. I'm not sure what that means. Hmm. I, I I've no never have, never been to the page and seen this service is currently unavailable. I mean, does that mean somebody at the pound for pound list just got cut and they don't want to have a pound for pound list up right now? I have no idea what that means. Yeah, I don't go there in general, so I, I don't I don't really know uh, what the situation would be. Yeah, that is just a strange one. But yes, I do have Rockhold ranked as number five. So. It, and to uh, give the odds makers some credit, I, I do agree with Todd's assertion that Belfort is the more tested and the more consistent of the two. He's the more known commodity. But but I think the fact that he's getting up there in age may at least play a factor. And the fact that he uh, lost a, in the decisive way that he did to John Jones may have some people thinking there are chinks in his armor that uh, a guy like Rockhold, who's young and hungry, might be able to exploit. Yeah, I mean, Rockhold is a guy that, I mean, the guys at, at AKA say this guy's a legit, real, a real tough fighter. And, I mean, he's training with really good guys. And, you know, he's a guy that, that that's done well thus far in his career. But, you know, you brought up earlier, Stevie, that the Strike Force guys have, have done pretty well for themselves thus far uh, moving over to UFC. But not all divisions are created equally. I mean, if you look at, you know, WEC, they're – you know, they're, they're, they're lightweights and they're welterweights, which, you know, were divisions where they moved over some high quality fighters, did pretty well when they moved over to the UFC, but it wasn't like their light heavyweights, um, or even their middleweights, uh, beyond Chael Sonnen did very well because those weren't divisions that were particularly focused on. And the Strike Force middleweight division was not one of their stronger divisions. And moreover, some of the best guys from the Strike Force middleweight division um, ended up getting moved over before the end of Strike Force just because they were more marketable. Jake Shields vacated that title. Um, Kung Lee vacated that title. Dan Henderson left back for the UFC. So it wasn't like Luke Rockhold, you know, uh, fought his way to the top of a, you know, of, of a stacked division um, by the standards of Strike Force. It, it was it, it, he wasn't facing the competition that that you know that 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 was a strike force lightweight division so i i think there there's right to be question marks about him going into this fight and you know we'll see how he does yeah you've you've almost convinced me to uh flip my pick but uh Maybe it'll just be that I'm going with Peter to uh, show solidarity since the Maple Leafs lost, but I, I'll stick with Rockhold for now. But you, you've definitely given me a compelling argument that Rockhold may not have faced the cream of the crop. However, the irony here is that one of the guys he beat to defend his title was Jacques Ray Souza, and he's in the co main event against Chris Camozzi. So, Todd, why don't you start with that fight, and then let's go to Peter. I mean, it's a shame that we didn't get the original fight with Jacare Souza and uh, and uh, Costa Filippo. I thought that was a really interesting fight, and uh, it was a shame it it got pulled. I mean, Chris Camozzi, not really a guy that I think they would have been looking to uh, to match up with Jacare, except that you know they had that opening and they needed to find the best available guy, and the best available guy that was already fighting um, around this time was Chris Camozzi. Um, so, I mean, he was going to be fighting on this card and now he's fighting, uh, moving up to fight Jacare. Kamosi, I remember the first time, the first few times I saw this guy, first on the Ultimate Fighter, and then I remember watching his fight, um, uh, live with, with Yang Dongi, which was on the, uh, the Velasquez Lesnar card. And I thought of, of Kamosi as a guy who had a lot of physical tools, but didn't seem like he really had put it together as a fighter. Um, you know, yes, he, he has a, a body for fighting. He's he's long. He's got a good reach. Um, he's got good athleticism. You know, there's sort of something to work with. But I didn't see a lot of development as a fighter. Um, but to the guy's credit, he's still very young, still only 26 years old, and he's starting to put it together. He's been, you know, he's on a four-fight winning streak. He's shown pretty good striking, pretty good takedown defense. He's a guy that looks to be on the rise, but Jacare is is not really a project. He's a guy that at this point is a well-rounded fighter. His strikes have come along a long way, and his 
Um, his submission game is world class. I mean, he's one of the the very uh, creme de la creme jujitsu guys in the in the entire sport, pound for pound. I mean, if you had to put, you know, the top the top five jujitsu practitioners in MMA, um, he'd be in that top five. And you know, Kamozi in the past has struggled with very good uh, jujitsu guys, and even guys that aren't that good at jiu-jitsu. So on paper, I look at this fight. Kamozi isn't a guy with a lot of knockout power. I think Jacare will land enough blows um, and even can probably beat him in, in the stand-up department to get on the inside. And if it goes to the ground, I think that Kamozi is going to be in a world of trouble. So I, I definitely um, favor the heavy favor in this one, uh, Jacare Souza. All right, Peter, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think uh, Jacare wins his hands down uh, by submission. Uh, Kamozi, as you said, Todd, he's a great fighter, but in my opinion, I think he's just getting fed to the slaughter here in this fight. I, I don't really think Kamozi will get out of the second round, I think. I mean, if it goes to the ground, it's going to end very quickly. I think the only Kamozi's chance has to be on the feet, and uh, Jacare will you know, counter any offense Kamozi will throw at him and take him down repeatedly, and I think it'll be a quick fight. I don't think this fight will be a decision. I guess I'm going to make it unanimous. I think Shock Ray wins this fight handily, which is really, you know, it's unfortunate for Kamozi because he's taking this fight, you know, obviously to replace Costa Filippo, and it's costing him. It's, you know, the guy is five out of his last six fights and four straight wins in the UFC, so it's probably going to knock him back down a few pegs to take this fight with Shock Ray, but that's just the way that it just works out for him, and uh, I, I'm sure he's not going to be you know, suffering any ill effects from this loss because you see appreciates the fact that he stepped up and it'll only be his first loss in his last five fights. So it, it's not like he'd get cut over it or anything, but it's it's just bad timing for Kamozi to take this fight when Jacare is on a roll and really seems to be looking to uh, vault himself up in the middleweight class and possibly be a contender in the near future. I don't know. I mean, I think that this is a big opportunity for him. I mean, I, so I don't expect him to win, but I mean, as a fighter, I mean, that's that's got to be what you're hoping for. He's a guy that's been fighting against mid-level guys, and here's a chance to to move himself to another level. A win over Jacare Souza makes people think of him in an entirely different light and moves him on to very big things. I, I, I think he's got to be, you know, kicking his heels and excited about the opportunity. Even if he suffers a setback, you know, at least he had the opportunity to, to, to move, up the, move up the card. I think, I think it's a great opportunity for Chris Camozzi. Yeah, uh, but not one that we think he's going to win either way. So great opportunity, but probably not going to be a, a great fight. Probably going to be a one-sided fight, but you never know it is mixed martial arts. But... In the lightweight fight of the main card, we have Rafael Dos Anjos and Evan Dunham. So, Peter, how about you start on this one? Uh, I think Dos Anjos uh, continues his winning win. Stevie? Hello? I think we lost there we go. There for just a second. We lost him? Uh-oh. Well, everybody's Todd. still showing us on, but... I'm still here. Right. Okay, there we go. We got Todd. All right, Todd. We got Todd, who do you think is going to win that fight? Um, I, I'm picking uh, Dunham in this fight. I think that... I didn't really. Um, I, I was I was surprised at how much hype Dos Anjos got after his last fight with Mark Bocek. I thought he looked good in that fight, um, but I didn't think he looked as great as a lot of people were saying. I mean, I, I was hearing raves about him, him as a potential lightweight contender, and I, I didn't see it quite frankly. I thought he was, you know, a better wrestler than Mark Bocek, um, and he used that to his advantage, but. Um, I don't think he's going to be a better wrestler than Evan Dunham. And Dunham, I mean, he's he's sort of, the, the hype has gone off him a little bit um, after that loss to Melvin Gillard a few years ago, and then a uh, a close, exciting fight with TJ Grant. But I mean, I think this guy, this guy is a, is a tough, stylistic matchup for Dos Anjos. I think he's going to be a little bit better striker. I think he's going to be a, a better wrestler. And I think he's going to take Dos Anjos out of his game um, which is, you know, trying to work the groundwork and, and, and working his top game. I think it's a, I think it's a bad matchup for Dos Anjos, and uh, I'm picking Dunham in this one. Like, if you take out his TKO stoppage against uh, Nick Lentz, he hasn't finished anybody since uh, Efren Escudero back in 2010. Uh, you know, I mean, he's a great fighter. I think he has uh, some potential to really make some damage uh, in this division, but... Dos Anjos, I just think with his his win streak right now, I think he's on a roll, and uh, I think he's going to roll over it on him. 
I'm going to actually go with Todd's point of view on this one because uh, Styles made fights, and stylistically, this is a bad fight for Dos Anjos. And uh, you talk about guys that uh, don't necessarily have a lot of, of momentum. You, you say he's got three wins in a row, but only one of those was a finish, and that was Kamal Chalarus, who uh, basically I feel like anybody can finish at this point. And then uh, he had a KO of George Sotteropoulos, who I also feel the same way about. So, it, you know, it, it's like, Where's the finishing power for Dos Anjos? I mean, he's he's capable of getting a decision. Occasionally, he's capable of getting a submission. But I, I don't see anything here that suggests to me that he's going to be able to handle getting out-wrestled by Dunham. And I, I, Todd may be right that his striking is not superior to Dunham either. So I, I would chalk this one up in Dunham's win column. Well, I mean, that's why they fight the fights, I guess. <laughs> yes, it is. And, uh, <laughs> speaking of guys that were getting an opportunity on the main card, uh, Jean Zeferino is going in here against Rafael Natal as a late replacement. So, uh, Todd, I know nothing about Zeferino. Maybe you know a little bit about him. Um, no, I, I, he, I mean, he's, he's pretty much been fighting on, on, uh, on the smaller circuit. I mean, and, and, uh, not, not, I don't know if any of his fights are, are widely available, so it's difficult to know what to, uh, what to expect out of him. He's got a pretty good record, um, primarily submissions um, being used. And here he's coming in on, uh, on you know, relatively short notice, which doesn't play to his favor. Um, Natal has, uh, I think he's looked pretty good um, in, his, in his early UFC career. Um, he, he, looked, he looked pretty solid in beating, uh, in beating Michael Kuyper, a guy who's, you know, I feel like made a pretty good accounting of himself in his, in his early UFC career. Um, and, you know, he's coming off a win, um, against Sean Spencer that was, you know, a pretty solid win in its own right. I, 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 I favor Natal because, you know, we've, I, I mean, he's looked to be a pretty good fighter thus far, um, going in there with a guy who's, you know, it was, it was very much a question mark, but I mean, you can only, you know, you can only have so much confidence when you don't really know that much about one of the guys. That's true. And, uh, Unfortunately for Zeferino, I have to go with Natal just because of the fact that I was there in Chicago to see him ar- get the arm triangle choke on Sean Spencer and thought Natal looked really good and uh, felt like the sky was the limit for this kid if he could go out there and continue to put on those kind of performances in the UFC. And, uh, you know, he's he's got a draw and a decision loss, but he's got a lot of wins other than that. So it, it seems to me Natal is probably going to mop the floor with Zeferino, but as Peter says, that's why they fight the fight, so maybe this is an upset in Peter's column. Well, Stevie, we actually saw Natal fight at UFC 124. He uh, had a oh, draw against right. Jesse Bongfeld. That's right. I forgot he fought at 124 as well, so I've seen him fight twice now. But uh, one thing about Natal that I didn't know until tonight is that we actually share a birthday. We're both born on Christmas, which is kind of cool. Um, I'm going to say Natal, I, I really rarely pick a fighter in his first fight in UFC because you don't know the competition he's had before. So I'm going to go with Natal. 